OK, so we're good to start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of Power BI Portugal Meetup. My name is Pedro Reis, and I'll be your host today. Today, we have a special guest, uh, Odeta. Uh, and I will ask you to help me to correctly pronunciate your second name, Odeta. Yeah, so it will be Yankaitana. So probably <laughs> you don't need to even try it because it's Yankatene. quite difficult. OK. Yeah. Okay, so really happy to 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 have you. Uh, Odetta is um, is a consultant at uh, Macau, and we'll get to know her uh, a little bit more in a few minutes and talk about a very interesting topic. We hope for you guys uh, today. It was one of the most voted topics in a recent pool that we did in the Power BI Portugal, and Odetta, we're really excited to have you here. OK, so guys, uh, I want to share a, a few updates uh, in the beginning of the, 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 the meetup regarding the next events that we have. Um, so the first one is on the last meetup. We didn't yet have the 4000 members on the meetup. So congratulations. Now we reached the 4000 members over 4050 members right now. So we hit this milestone so really good. So we'll check who is the lucky number 4000 for maybe a special uh, um, small award for the number 4000. OK. So uh, another update, uh, the meetup that we had planned for Danes Torres, uh, it was scheduled for the 23rd of May, but we anticipated this and the meetup will be on the 16th of May. This is because on the 23rd and 24th of May, there will be a huge event. I will speak about it uh, in a few minutes. That would be coincident. In that way, you guys can come to the Power BI Data Marts event with Dennis, and you can also go to the Microsoft Build event that I will just talk in a, in a, in a minute too. So on the 16th, during this event, I will also launch the, the call, um, the, the link for the meetup so that you guys can register for this event and come. If you are interested in data marts and the opinion of uh, Danish Torres and his tests, please come to this event. Uh, the other uh, event that we also had scheduled for the first semester of the year, the final one is the event with uh, Reed Havens, and this will be um, a presential uh, meetup uh, at the beautiful city of uh, Porto. And we have room for about 100 people in the auditorium. So um, I will share details during the month how you can register for this. And if you want, uh, how you can come and attend this special uh, meetup with uh, Reed. Taking advantage that Reed is going to be uh, at uh, Porto, we have also um, aligned Reed will be available for a workshop on the same day of the meetup, so on 27 of uh, June. And uh, I think this is a fantastic opportunity, guys, if you have interest in, uh, you know, enhancing your data visualization skills, your report building techniques, and especially that last mile that can give the wow factor to the users, you have the link here. I'll also put it in a chat in a minute about the, um, I'll actually put it right now in the chat. Uh, and you guys, if you are curious, you can see uh, um, what is the program of uh, this event. There is a limited number of people that can can attend this one day workshop with the read. So if you're interested in this, the price is very uh, inviting. It's uh, I think it's it's great. So please uh, register for this if you are interested in uh, enhancing your data visualization uh, skills and reporting uh, in, and enhancing your report design. Other update, so the Microsoft build is scheduled for uh, the 23rd and 24th of May uh, on this month. Uh, the sessions will be from 16 uh, until uh, about 24, um, uh, so from 4 p.m. up to uh, midnight, and the sessions every day on the Portuguese uh, uh, timetable. And you will have uh, in the beginning uh, the news by Satya Nadella, as usual, and also we have the first session with uh, Aaron Ulag. Uh, the first data platform session should be very interesting with a lot of uh, a lot of news and really game changer news uh, to who works with Power BI, uh, who works with Azure, with who works with the Synapse, etc. There will be uh, mind blowing uh, news. Who works with uh, also artificial intelligence and with uh, Copilot and with OpenAI uh, on Azure. All of this will have uh, very important news. So uh, if you are interested in this, register for the event and check it out, uh, not to miss. This will be really, really, really exciting. So this is it. So it's time to start the, the meetup. So 
we, our guest, uh, Odette, as I mentioned, um, is an experienced consultant at uh, Macau. I met her briefly also at uh, Sequel Beat, so that I hope you had uh, some fun during the conference and would like also to hear how was your experience. And she is also someone who likes uh, horror movies and some more heavy music. So if you guys have common interest in that, I'm sure that Odette can give good picks. Hello, Odette, and welcome. Yeah, hey. Uh, so yeah, if you have any recommendations for some good horror movie, put in the chat. I was, I would be very glad to hear those. And yeah, we met in the sequel bits in March, and it was really a nice event. I think if any of you have uh, opportunity to participate that in it uh, next year, I would definitely suggest to do that. Uh, since it's a really huge event in UK and you can hear and see a lot of uh, interesting people and interesting sessions there. So yeah, I myself also did uh, two sessions there. One was about how to create uh, CV with Power BI and another one was uh, how to to collaborate and share Power BI artifacts with external users. Um, yeah, so probably for today, I will try to share my screen. Just give me a minute or probably. And, the, the, and these sessions, uh, usually SQL Bits releases the sessions uh, publicly a couple of months afterwards. So if you're interested in you like this session of Odetta, mm -hmm. you might find also her content in the near future on those topics too. Okay. Yeah. So you have a nice cockpit, Odetta. So I'll let you pilot the session. Uh, good luck. And we'll be here with some questions, guys. So if you have questions, post it in the chat and I'll call it up for Odetta. Okay. Yeah. Maybe share. And let me know if you can see the screen. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Um, so as you know, today we gathered for the topic of governance of Power BI environment. And a short introduction about myself regarding my uh, uh, Power BI skills, if I can say that. So uh, I am Odetta, and as uh, Pedro mentioned, I'm working at Macaw uh, as a data analytics consultant. Um, also, I'm working in the data field uh, 10 years already, and with Power BI six years. Uh, mainly, I work as a Power BI developer, if you can call it like that. But it doesn't matter what is the title, uh, but uh, my main uh, activities are creating reports, uh, sharing them, uh, also managing um, the whole Power BI environment and consulting clients on Power BI solutions. So also it could be a little bit uh, related to Azure or the, some other databases and other sources. So it doesn't matter what you use in Power BI. As you know, it can have a lot of different things in it. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, you, you need to know how to use it in your organization. So I'm helping uh, about this uh, um, for our Macaw clients. Um, I'm situated in Lithuania, as you can see in the small um uh, picture on the left and here is uh on the right you can see uh, a sneak peek of vilnius so the city where i'm living already i'm not sure about 15 years now um but yeah and so if you ever wondered um where it is you can so i just invite you to visit if you're interested in uh, uh, Baltic countries to see how we are um, living there and how it looks like. But going back to the today's topic, uh, it's quite a huge topic, I would say, and I could talk about it probably for a week or even more. Uh, but uh, today I hope to give you at least a short 
introduction and what you can think of when you would like to set up, for example, governance for your own organization. Um, so I will talk about five main pillars as I see that you need to cover when you think of how to govern your Power BI environment. Uh, also, I will touch about uh, self-service levels. Uh, I will talk about admin portal. This again is quite a huge topic and you can spend quite some time on it, but still I just want to give you an overview of what's possible there. Uh, then I touch a little bit about gateway management, security, licensing, and finally I will give you two examples how you can automate my manual administrative work. Um, using, for example, APIs and PowerShell commandlets. So starting about Power BI governance. Um, as I said, it's quite a huge topic and I would like to talk about each and every uh, pillar of it uh, quite intensely, but we don't have that much time. Uh, so if you have any questions, I don't know if Pedro mentioned, but probably you can ask those uh, on the chat or later we will have some time dedicated to it. So just um, let me know. Um, but um, as an overview, I would say data governance is mainly related to policies and processes of managing data. So you need to establish those that all of our, all of your users uh, would know how to, uh, for example, set up everything correctly, how they can um, create reports, what should be naming conventions and other things, like a lot of things can uh, relate to the processes and policies. <clears throat> Sorry, a little bit. Um, also, the quite huge part is security and access control, because as you know, if you're working with a sensitive data, you really need to know who can access it and who cannot. And this is why you need to uh, manage access and control it from time to time. And of course, you need to think about content management. So here is the guidelines for report development, versioning, and naming conventions. And naming conventions is quite important part because, for example, if you have a lot of workspaces created, you need to know from its name, for example, what kind of data I can find it. Maybe it's financial data or maybe it's product data. And also, since you have a lot of policies, processes, and everything in one place, uh, the uh, I think quite important part is also training and documentation, because you need to put everything in writing that people would know how to process. <laughs> sorry, how to process everything, um, and how to proper use Power BI. So this is a very important thing because it's um, there are a lot of cases that people do not uh, reports not with best practices in mind. So it's very important, especially when you are uh, using premium capacity, for example, because it could be very costly. So you need to know those best practices. So you need to train your users to use them. And the last thing would be monitoring. Um, so you need to prevent uh, some issues. So you need to know what's happening in, what, in your environment. So you can look through uh, usage activities. So for example, what people are using, uh, how many workspaces do you have, uh, what, what artifacts in those workspaces you can find and so on. 
And you really don't need to forget about people also, because if you identify the right roles and fill them with the right people, it will make sure that your processes will work more efficiently. So again, don't forget about the people and training part of uh, the governance. And now going to the level of self-service, why it is important to talk about it here, because depending on that level, uh, you can, for example, set up your Power BI uh, environment differently, uh, depending on what self-service you have, uh, level of self-service you have in your organization, or maybe what level you would like to have. So what are those levels? Um, for example, here you can see three levels. Business-led self-service BI, AT-managed self-service BI, and corporate BI. What are the differences? The differences would be that, for example, on the left, everything is done by business users. So it's self-service uh, 100%. And uh, like you have all the data sets created by business people, you have all the reports created, reports, dashboards, apps, and wherever you have in your Power BI environment also created by business people. So they are owning data sets, they are owning reports, they are owning um, data, um, how to say, uh, if data is true or not. So they are owning everything there. So if you go, for example, to the uh, Power BI tenant settings and you have, for example, a setting uh, regarding workspaces. So uh, you can enable workspace creation for everyone. You can disable it for everyone or you can enable it just for particular uh, people. In this case, when you have a business-led self-service BI. You want to enable everyone to create workspaces, but of course you don't need to forget that you need to implement some guidelines, processes, and so on, how this should be done in the correct way that it wouldn't be uh, too overwhelming to then manage everything for the Power BI administrator, for example. Uh, then the Opposite thing would be a corporate BI. So then 100% of everything in your Power BI environment uh, would be uh, handled by IT, for example, or it could be a Power BI team. It doesn't matter how you call it, but in this example, it's IT. So it means that everything is done by IT. Data sets are created by IT, reports, dashboards, everything which you can imagine is done by ET and the business users are only the users of those resources. So they are just interacting with reports, apps, and looking at the data, drawing some conclusions and so on, but they are not creating anything. And in the middle, it could be a blended thing. So it's here it's called AT Managed Self-Service BI. It means that, uh, for example, Power BI or IT department are creating all the data sets, but business users are using those data sets for their reports. So they are just using the, um, you can call it certified or just approved by IT data sets. So then you know that is it is 100 that the data is 100% correct and the owner of the data is uh, uh, IT, but you can create your reports and of course you should be, or in this case, uh, business users are the owners of those reports. So again, going to example for workspace creation, when you have this approach, so probably it's best to have uh, only particular people uh, that can create a workspaces and not everyone. So in this case, it should be only IT people who can create workspaces. And if you are a business user and you want 
additional workspace for your reports, you need to request that. So again, you need to go into the processes part and do everything there. And since I didn't mention the example, but probably you already can guess, uh, if you have a corporate BI, so you are uh, just, again, enabling workspaces only for IT people, and you are not letting business users to do anything with workspaces or anything other related to admin settings. So also what I meant about uh, that you should know where you want to go. Because for example, maybe you are not that very mature right now in your Power BI journey, if I can call it like that. Um, so maybe for now, you don't believe that your business users are capable of creating reports, doing everything um, with the best practices in mind. Maybe you don't have a training prepared or any, any documentation and so on. So probably the best case for you now would be to start with a corporate BI. But it doesn't mean that it don't need to, it cannot change. So you can change it that to the uh, blended approach or maybe to the business, let's say service BI at some point. But again, you need to know where you are going and yeah, so talking about admin uh, settings, I would like to talk about admin portal and what can be found there. So in the Power BI admin portal, the first thing you see would be tenant settings. Um, probably you cannot see this picture, so I will just zoom a little bit in. So this is uh, the example that I was talking about, workspace settings. So in the tenant settings, uh, first of all, I think this is the very important part uh, for the Power BI admin portal, because there are a lot of settings that common Power BI developers don't even have a clue about. For example, if I I'm a Power BI developer, and I don't know about the setting that you can restrict workspace creation. Uh, I would think, okay, so I connect to Power BI service, I try to create a workspace, and I cannot do that. I would think, okay, so maybe there is a bug. So, uh, but apparently, there is a workspace setting in the Power BI tenant settings. Um, Again, there could be a setting that you restrict people from using custom visuals. Again, from all of those Power BI blocks and so on, I know that I can use custom visuals. But OK, I go to my Power BI desktop, I try to use it, and I cannot. Again, I would think it is a bug. But apparently, Power BI administrator just restricted access. Uh, so as you can see, there are some settings that can be applied to entire organization or disabled for entire organization. And a lot of um, settings has an option to apply to specific security groups. So it means it could be an Azure security group or Active Directory security group or just specific people. So you can add just emails there. And of course, you can uh, um, exclude some specific security groups or people from this. So for example, you can say that I enable that for entire organization, but I exclude, for example, Odetta from creating workspaces because I know that she is quite messy and she creates a lot of workspaces unnecessary. So then I avoid this and remove this risk. So yeah, so I would tell you that you need to spend quite some time in the tenant settings space and to look everything because setting up is one thing, but knowing exactly what each and every uh, tenant setting is about is a different case because there are some very uh, 
maybe unusual settings for you, or at least it could be, or that you hear about it for the first time. So you really need to dig in into documentation, and sometimes the documentation is very vague, so you need, again, dig more into some blogs and so on, so or ask chat GPT about it, so, you know. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely say that you need to spend some time there. Then another thing that you can see there would be usage metrics. Uh, it is uh, there you will see a small dashboard about Power BI usage uh, in your organization. Another thing is users management, but as you may see from this picture, again, I will zoom a little bit, that there is no direct uh, management thingy there in the Power BI services, but there is a button that you can go to Microsoft 365 Admin Center and then manage users there. Um, another thing that you can see there would be premium per user configuration. So again, this is how it looks like. So you can uh, put their automatic page refresh, change detection measures, and data set workload settings. So set XMLA endpoint to read only or read write, depending if you want your users to use um, some kind of APIs or, for example, tabular editor for your uh, work and connect to the data, uh, data sets that are in your power that are in Power BI service. The next thing would be audit logs. So here again, you have a, I have an option to go to Microsoft 365 Admin Center, and the audit logs are very a uh, nice feature because you can see a lot of things what are happening in your Power BI services. So from there, you can have some kind of monitoring setup uh, for your um, users activities to track those. Another thing that you can find in admin portal is capacity settings. So I would say this is the second most important thing in admin portal because there you can manage your premium capacities. Uh, first of all, of course, Power BI administrator need to buy it, and then you can manage it. Um, and also you can see a refresh summary there. So now regarding, again, those print screens, an example, what you can see there, for example, uh, in Mako, we have Power BI embedded capacity. I won't go into much detail what are the differences there, but I will provide some links for you if you want to go deeper into these topics. But for example, here I can see uh, that I have a capacity. Uh, it's called Power BI Premium and something else. Um, then I have a capacity admins. So I can see who are administrators of this capacity. I can make some actions. I see status of this, if it's on or paused or something else, the region, again, capacity metrics. So this SQ, uh, SKU is it called? So this is just the size of your capacity. Uh, I will talk about capacities a little bit later. And for the refresh, so here, for example, you have a uh, name of something that is refreshing in your Power BI uh, capacity. And in this case, this something is a data set. Uh, you can see in what workspace it is, what kind of capacity is assigned to it, um, start time, duration, and some other metrics there, and also the owners. For example, if you can see some data sets that are refreshing very mm, very long for example duration is very large so then you can contact the owner and ask what the hell is happening there maybe you need some help uh, to optimize this data set also important part would be embedded codes 
So this is the part where you can see all the embedded codes, meaning that you had those codes that people in your organization used to share um, to share uh, publicly. So again, so here you would see report name, workspace name, published by, and status. And of course, you can see that there are some tenant settings related to it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, some tenant settings related to it. So it can be enabled or disabled for your organization too. Another thing is organizational visuals. So <coughs> this is the place where you can see if you are using any and if you created, for example, in my case, we don't have those in Macaw. So I didn't, um, I don't have an example to show you. Another thing that you can see there is Azure Connections. Again, you, if you have something um, set up there, you will see like subscription, resource group, and other things that you can set up there. So again, if you are using Azure Resources, this could be interesting part for you. And also very important part is workspaces. So here you see all the workspaces you have in your Power BI tenant. And again, oh, sorry, um, I will zoom a little bit. So why this, for example, is uh, important in my mind, uh, because as a Power BI administrator, you can grant yourself access to access those workspaces. So again, for example, uh, user needs some help there, but you cannot help if you cannot access uh, the resources there. So here, this is the place where you can do that and put the access there and you can see if it has some capacity uh, associated with, or I should say assigned to the workspace and what are the status there. Another thing is custom branding and this custom branding is related to Power BI services. So for example, you can add uh, uh, a logo to it, uh, put everything in your organizational organization's colors. So it's not very a uh, huge one, but here you can upload, as I said, logo, also cover image and theme color. And a few more things. Um, the last two, there is a protection um, metrics. So you can, again, see a small report regarding metrics to monitor and check for example, sensitivity labels usage, if you are using those in your organization. And moreover, you had this button for Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps Portal to view more metrics. And the last thing that you can see in uh, admin portal is featured content. Uh, meaning that you can decide what kind of reports or dashboards everyone should see when they open Power BI uh, service. So just when they go to powerbi.com, for example, in this case, I can set that uh, they should see report named data protection metrics. And again, I can see where this report is, who is the owner and when this was set up. 
and that's it regarding admin portal. So as you can see, there are a lot of uh, parts that are related to the admin portal, and I don't have much time to go into details about each and every does, but as I said, I would tell you to investigate yourself and mainly focus on the admin settings and capacity settings if you are using, of course, premium in your organization. And now moving to another uh, part of uh, governance, it would be gateway management. So I don't know if all of you knows who, uh, what the gateway is, uh, but I have few slides related to it. Uh, so hopefully it would help at least to know what the hell it is and uh, if you need to use it in your organization uh, or not. Um, so the gateway I would call or Power BI, uh, or I should say Microsoft call it uh, as a bridge between your uh, data and Power BI services. Because for example, you can have your data into SQL database and what Gateway does, uh, when you schedule refresh for your report um, and you have connected a Gateway to this uh, data set, uh, then the Gateway, as I can call it, like calls to a SQL database or whatever data source you have uh, there. So it goes to the uh, data source, gathers all the data it can have it and then it uploads it to your report. So again, it helps to refresh your data, but it does in the secure way, meaning that you can have those in different locations, for example, on premises, on cloud, and you can use those in your uh, data, uh, in your reports, and also you can uh, share those connections to with others. Uh, there are three main, or I should say just three uh, types of gateways, uh, on-premises data gateway, personal mode, on-premises data gateway, and virtual network data gateway. Uh, the first one, so on-premises data gateway means that you have a gateway that you can share uh, with others, and uh, it's managed by uh, probably, oh, sorry, uh, managed by uh, a gateway administrator uh, or the person that uh, could be assigned as administrator. It could be just also, also business user. So the main difference is that it allows multiple users to use it. But uh, the second type personal mode, it lets only one user to connect to the gateway and to the sources that this gateway has, and it cannot be shared. So this is why it's written that preferred would be, uh, if you can call it enterprise use or just on-premises data gateway, not on personal mode. Um, because as I said, for personal mode, it cannot be shared with others, so there could be a lot of people creating the same data sources for uh, for the gateways, for their gateways. And the last thing is virtual network data gateway. So this again allows multiple users to connect uh, to multiple data sources uh, and they are secured by virtual networks. Um, there no installation is required because, for example, for the on-premises data gateway, personal or not personal mode, uh, the data gateway needs to be installed on a virtual machine that preferably is running uh, every time, like every second of the day, so preferably not your computer. Um, and virtual data network, uh, it doesn't need to be installed. It just need to be um, set up and it's done in Microsoft managed service. Um, <clears throat> so it's required uh, by that. But uh, again, I will give you some um, some links at the end. Uh, so probably I will just share this 
uh, slides as a PDF for you to have all the links and information there. Um, because, for example, virtual networks, uh, virtual network data gateways are not that widely used. So this is why I'm not going into much details. Uh, now regarding other things for Power BI Gateway, uh, the best practice is to have production and not production data gateway, meaning that in the production data gateway, you are adding uh, data sources that are production data sources. And for non-production, as you can guess it, it's about non-production data sources. And for the production data gateway, uh, the best practice is to use uh, these things called clusters, meaning that, for example, you are creating or you are installing two data gateways in two different virtual machines, or it could be just some servers. And um, you have them both running, and you can put them in the thing called cluster on the same cluster, meaning that these two data gateways will have the same data sources available to them and connected to them. But for example, if one server or one virtual machine is down at the time that the report or some data flow or wherever refreshes and it cannot connect to that server, then it's going to that another server on the same cluster. And this is how you see this is how you have this called fillover mechanism that you have every time available gateway. Because usually, for example, there are some cases that the server needs to restart, or maybe it's down uh, for whatever reason. So this is why you are setting up a cluster with two data gateways. Then another thing that there is the gateway performance monitoring and preview. Uh, again, I can provide a link to dig deeper into it, but as you uh, can imagine, the name says that it's performance monitoring, so you can see the performance at gateways. And again, you should think about naming conventions for the data sources, because as I said, those data gateways and these data sources can be shared uh, for multiple users. So, and for example, maybe in your organization, multiple users can create those data sources uh, so that you don't have a lot of duplicates. Uh, the best case is to have some processes or policies how about naming conventions, how these data sources needs to be uh, called that everyone would know. Okay, if I'm using like some kind of financial uh, data or HR data, they are called like this and anyone can use this data source and they don't need to create another one and another one. Because as you know, to have a tidy uh, space is the uh, always preferred way. And now going to the security topic. Again, usually it's quite, uh, I, I, I would say quite, uh, um, big topic when you talk about data governance. So here I will mention a list what you can do uh, to manage your security. So for example, I would suggest to use strong authentication. Um, there is such a thing uh, as multi-factor authentication, NFA. I don't know if you have all of you have in the in your organizations, but for example, since in Macor we are working with a lot of different clients, not every client is using that, and it means that your environment is not that secure, and it's quite uh, it could be quite easy to um, to connect to it or to access it. So what this uh, multi-factor authentication does, it means that. Usually it uses your, for example, mobile device uh, that you have to uh, double authenticate your connection. So you're adding your password and plus it asks you to go to uh, 
to the app and add some uh, code, or it could be just press accept or that it's okay, it's me and so on. So that you definitely know that this is the person who wants to, um, to access your Power BI environment. Another thing is access control and principle of least privilege. So again, um, here you can include, for example, Azure Active Directory to uh, see uh, access control. So, so to control your access to your Power BI environment and the principle of least privileges means that you are letting people to see only what they need to see and you are not letting them do everything. So in this case, it could be that you are not sharing like every report in the works in the financial, for example, workspace, but you are sharing only particular reports that this person can have can have access to. Because otherwise you have a better possibility to uh, wrong people access confidential data or very confidential data like HR and especially finance data. Another thing would be data security. As you know, there are a lot of things there. So for example, row level security, object level security, sensitivity labels, privacy uh, levels and workspace security. Um, so I would say definitely use workspace security and those roles. And uh, you should know what each and every role means. For example, you have admin, member, contributor, and viewer. Uh, so as probably a lot of you know, admin can do everything in the workspace and viewer can only view the reports or just uh, Power BI artifacts that are shared with uh, the person. So of course there could be something in between, but again, you should know which people needs to access everything, uh, who needs to, uh, who maybe is not that uh, capable of managing workspace and maybe can do some harm even accidentally, like deleting a report or something like that. So probably it's better to put those uh, people as the viewers of the workspace. So again, uh, you need to think about that very carefully. The other thing is data gateway security. Um, so again, you need to know that you can uh, put some firewall configurations on the data gateway. Also, the data gateways uh, get an update from time to time. So uh, for them to work very securely, they need to be up to date. So again, uh, you cannot do that automatically unless you use something as uh, PowerShell commandlet. If there is something like that, I didn't check. Uh, but uh, in other case, you need to go to the server or to virtual machine where this data gateway is installed and you need to press update and update it manually. So again, this needs to be maintained. <clears throat> Another thing, again, I will uh, repeat myself, but it's very important to audit and monitor uh, your user's activity. So see if your uh, set policies and uh, uh, processes are working and if users are doing what you need them to do. So usually you can monitor that through uh, log analytics, as I said or audit logs or some APIs. So there is a possibility to do that. And another thing, you can enable Azure Active Directory conditional uh, access. Now, I'm not sure if every one of you 
is using Azure in your organization, so I won't go into much detail on it. But, <clears throat> sorry, uh, you can put a policies to control access to Power BI based uh, on user location or device or other factors. So for example, you can set up that only people from this location can access if you know where your people are situated. Um, or from just the devices that you know that are secure. And one more thing, regularly review permissions. So again, if you know that for example, person uh, left the company or moved to uh, another department, you need to know if their access changed. Of course, if they left the company, it's just uh, removing access from everything and is done probably the best by just deleting their account. Uh, but it's another case when the person is moving from one um, one job to another, from one department to another. So maybe now he can or she or they can access more data or less data than they did before. So you need to uh, regularly review that. And the last thing, again, uh, I will be repeating educate your users. So make sure that they know what kind of processes and policies you want to establish and be used and the best practices share them make uh, knowledge sharing sessions make a chats for example or channels uh, for people to share the best practices there and have some use cases uh, frequently asked questions or anything that you can think of that would make your users uh, life uh, just easier And now moving to licensing. Um, again, I will go not very deep into this topic because uh, this is quite huge and you can talk about it even about like premium uh, a few days or even more. Um, so here, uh, as maybe you know that uh, Power BI admin uh, has opportunity or has access to buying uh, licenses and uh, capacities for Power BI. It can be done. <clears throat> I won't go into detail how it can be done because you need to uh, contact your license providers and they know best the prices and everything. So again, it can vary for different organizations, different uh, places. But I will go just quickly. So there are two type of licenses per user license and capacity based. Per user would be a free, uh, pro or premium per user and capacity would be just premium. So what each and every of these um, can do, <laughs> if you can say like that. So for Power BI free, it's only for personal use and it's more for like self-service. So people can just have Power BI desktop, create reports and have their workspace called My Workspace and nothing more. They cannot share this with others because if you want to share, then you need a Power BI Pro or Power BI uh, Premium per user license. So as you can see here, Power BI Pro is for sharing and collaborating. And again, you have all your workspaces in the shared resources capacity, if you can call it like that, and meaning that you don't have a reserved uh, gigabytes or cores for your workspace, for your data sets. Um, and for Power BI Premium, per, or premium per user, you have a flexibility to license by capacity. Uh, also, you can share even with the people that don't have a license. 
So again, those are licensing, but they are not all related to uh, to the user itself. And regarding premium capacities, here is a short table uh, where you can see a lot of capacities there and a lot of data, but just to be quick, um, what you can see there, I will have a laser, probably it would be the best. So the main thing is B cores. So what is the size of your capacity? And it could be from one core to 128. Um, but for example, why you can use this premium capacity? So it's for bigger data sets, for premium features like AI or data marts or something else. Um, also, we have max memory for your data sets. So for example, if I have P1, I will have V cores and I will have 25 gigabytes for each my, of my data sets, meaning that my each data set can become 25 gigabytes large. Again, some other things there, but I don't have much time now for this. <clears throat> also, the small uh, table, what can be done uh, for every of these uh, licenses types and what kind of uh, workspaces you have. Because as you know, premium capacity can be only assigned to the workspace. It cannot be assigned to the user until unless it's premium per user, but it doesn't have all the features that the premium has. Uh, but for more details, again, I will provide the link. But here, for example, if I am a free user and I cannot access anything else at le and, uh, in but uh, my workspace, uh, but if there are a capacity uh, workspaces on premium capacity, then pro user or premium per user license user, uh, they can share the content with free user, as I said. So there are simple uh, things, maybe. Uh, it could seem simple things there, but it's quite complicated. Uh, but yeah, just dig into more details uh, after this uh, presentation. And the last thing that I would like to share with you is automating manual work. So I would like to show you two examples uh, how you as a Power BI admin can uh, do some manual work automatically or semi-automatically since you still need to write some code for it. But it's really not that complicated if you know uh, how to do it. Uh, so for example, you can use Power BI REST API and for it, you can have, for example, a list of any uh, Power BI artifact in your uh, organization, or as I'm telling a lot here, a Power BI tenant. So meaning you can have a list of all the apps you have in your organization. Uh, another thing, you can assign or unassign uh, specified workspaces to the specified premium capacity. So again, if you have like 100 workspaces that you need to assign premium capacity, uh, it could be quite time consuming for it, but uh, with a small script, you can run it in very, very quickly. Uh, also, the example could be that you can have a list of audit activity events for a tenant. For example, who viewed your report, uh, who uh, use the export to Excel option. And also you can restore deleted workspaces. So these are only an examples what can be done, but there are quite a lot of things that you can do. And Microsoft is adding more and more, and more uh, those APIs. Uh, so more and more capabilities you can have there. Uh, and the PowerShell commandlet, why I have an example for it is because I didn't see anything with gateways in Power BI REST API. And here you can, with some commandlets, you can install, configure, manage security, and do some other things with the gateways. 
Yeah. So for example, if I want to use REST API to unassign workspaces from capacities, so unassign multiple workspaces in Microsoft documentation, I had this uh, API called admin capacities and assign workspace from capacity. And there you will see only this thing. So you will have a HTTP request here. You will have requested bodies, so you will see that workspaces, you need to specify workspaces that you uh, need to unassign. And also the response will be just 200 OK, that's everything done correctly. So now how to use this in your work? Uh, there is a try it button. So when you press it, you will see something like that. So now at least you will know how to write this body part, but still it's not very clear how to put there multiple workspaces. Um, so this is why I showed this example. Um, so for this, you can use, for example, PowerShell. And if you're using it for the first time, you need to run few sentences first or code lines. Uh, so in this case, you need to install module called Microsoft Power BI Management. And then you need to connect uh, as a Power BI administrator, because as you saw here, the name is admin, meaning that only admins or you can use service principal with the admin permissions. Uh, but again, uh, you need admin permissions to run this. Um, so for this, you can run connect Power BI service account, and then you will be prompted to the window where you have to connect uh, with your credentials. And here in green, you can see how to write comments in PowerShell. So this should be run only once. And if you use it from time to time, you don't need to run these two lines again. And uh, now moving to the API call. So how to use this HTTP request. Um, the first, I can write a variable. In this case, is called body, and it's written with a dollar sign. And this syntax here, um, again, workspaces to assign. So you need those square brackets. And in the double quotes, you need to add workspace IDs. And workspace IDs can be found in the Power BI service when you are in the workspace, and it's in the URL. So this is where you can find those things. And the last thing is that you need to run this uh, API call. So what needs to be? So again, everything for, doesn't matter which API call you're using, the beginning will be the same. It will be invoke minus Power BI REST method, minus method, and now here, the name could be different depending on what you can see in the, uh, documentation. So in this case, I wrote post because here the first word in the HTTP request is post. So you see the first word and you put it there, then it's minus URL. And here you put the last part of this HTTP. So the URL exactly as it is in the documentation. And the last part would be minus body, and you are putting this variable there. And you will get just the response 200 OK that you unassigned the premium capacity. So you can go to Power BI services and look at it and see how it looks like. And I see that I'm uh, running out of time or I already ran into, but I have only the last example. So hopefully you don't mind that I will take uh, a little bit more of your attention. No um, worries, but... no worries. Go ahead. With it. Great. Thank you. Uh, so the last example would be with data gateways. So how to install that automatically. So for example, if you need to do that uh, only once, so Maybe you don't need to use it, but if you are installing and installing into multiple virtual machines, then this could be useful. Or maybe you will have some other things that you need to do with gateways. So 
how to do that. Again, you have to go into Microsoft documentation. Uh, but the first thing is that you need to have PowerShell 7.0 or higher in order to run this. Uh, so you need to uh, upgrade your PowerShell if you don't have this version. And there are some, of course, uh, things how to check it. Um, but now you need to use a commandlet add data gateway cluster. And again, in the documentation, you can see uh, what should be there. So again, you write add data gateway cluster. Then you need to provide recovery key and gateway name. And in the square brackets is uh, there are optional things that you can put region. Uh, you can overwrite existing gateway if there is already gateway created, so you can overwrite it. And regarding recovery key, so you need that in order to recover gateway if it becomes corrupted or someone deletes it accidentally or something wrong happens. So this is why you need to recover a key and recover a key. So it's just the string that you think of and add there. And you need, of course, to put it, save it somewhere that you can use it uh, when you need to. Uh, then you need to recover this gateway. So again, in the PowerShell, if you're using it for the first time, you need to run again a few lines of code. So install module and name data gateway. Again, you need to connect. Now, as you can see, it's it looks like a little bit different because now we don't use Power BI REST API, but we are using this data gateway uh, thingy. Uh, so again, if you connect, and you need to connect with an account that can create the data gateways. And you will get something like this. So we'll have environment, your tenant ID, and your username. So probably it will be just the email address. So again, you run those for the first time. You don't need to do that anytime more. And the Interesting part here is you can download and install the gateway just by running this line, install data gateway and accept conditions. That's it. So you do need to go to uh, Google and ask how to download data gateway or to go to Power BI service and download it there. So you are just running this one line. And one more thing that you need to be on that machine. So you need to log in into that virtual machine server or wherever where you want to install this. So you cannot do that from your personal computer because otherwise you will install a gateway on your personal computer. And when this is running, you will see that it's downloading, installer completes it, starting to install and completes installing data gateway on a server or your computer or wherever you are located and running this. And the last part, so is this. It's a little bit, I would say, simpler than the previous example. So you, again, you are using add data gateway cluster. So wherever you saw there, add data gateway cluster, you just copy then minus recovery key or minus data gateway name. Uh, it doesn't need to be in that order. So in my example, you can see that I just uh, started from the name. So I call it my new gateway, uh, then minus recovery key. And I added one thing, so read the host. It means that it will write me a line, enter recovery key. And as a curse string part means that when you will be writing your recovery key. So when you are putting that, uh, you will see the asterisks and not the uh, string that you are putting there. So then you have a secure string, as it's called it here. And after it run it, how you can check it, you can go to Power BI service, uh, the manage connections and gateway section. Uh, you will see this. So as in my case, I can see my new gateway. I can see the same uh, admin at uh, something. 
uh, users it there. There are some status if it's on or off and how many gateways it has. So by running just these simple free lines, you can have installed this data gateway and have it in your Power BI service. So yeah, that's it. Uh, so just be quick. Uh, as I said, you need to have um, everything set up to have accurate, secure, and consistent reporting in your environment. Uh, you need to remember to assign roles to suitable individuals because then everything goes smoothly and define the level of service of your organization because then you know how to set up your tenant settings, how to set up your policies and so on. Um, and of course, don't forget that there are ways to automate your work. And yeah, thank you. And the last will be all these uh, links that I told you. So uh, you will be able to dig deeper into this. So yeah. The thank you very much for that. <laughs> thank you very much. It was really great. And uh, um, so I see a lot of thumbs up. So I I, I, um, I see that you guys uh, appreciated the content. It's a lot to cover. Uh, maybe, um, well, there are times on the BI world where you need more self-service BI. There are times in the BI world where you need things a little bit more federated. And these things tend to have a cycle. You go up, you go down, you go self-service BI, then you need someone to bring order. It's a great idea to start a center of excellence and there is documentation on the Microsoft, like Odetta shared, that you can start this from the beginning. So if you have the chance to use these principles that Odetta shared from the beginning, that's fantastic. Otherwise, you'll have more problems ahead. So thanks a lot, guys. We we are out of time for questions, but you have the contacts for that. You have the Power BI Portugal uh, email. So if you have any question that you didn't think so far, feel free to email us or email direct, directly Odetta and we'll make it uh, reach uh, Odetta. Odetta, it was a pleasure to have you here in our community. And maybe we see you soon with another topic for our next call for speakers for the next semester. Yeah, thank you a lot, Pedro, and thanks everyone for listening to me. Uh, so, as Pedro said, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm really glad to talk about this topic. As you saw, it's quite huge, so I cannot cover everything in this short amount. But yeah, and hopefully see you next time in some other sessions or even in yours. Meet up. Absolutely. Thank you, Odette. Thanks, everyone. And see you on the 16th of May on the meetup of uh, Dennis Torres. Uh, thank you, guys. See you there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.